There's no secret, there's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent, be still, and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't gonna happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. If you are looking to live at the tip of the spear when it comes to health optimization, join my private membership group, Fully Optimized Health, Dot com and get the latest and greatest on hormone optimization, peptides, fitness, fat loss, and most importantly, raising your vibration. Again, go over to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up today. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you might be around the world. Of course, I am Jay Campbell, and you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I am very excited today to be joined in my virtual StreamYard studio by the man, the myth, the legend, Jim Laird. Jim, what's going on, my brother? Not much, man. How are you? Things are great here in uh, in Nicaragua. Jim is in Nicaragua. So Jim, uh, for those of you who don't know Jim, and I know a lot of people in my audience do know Jim, is a very revered strength and conditioning coach. He's coached all sorts of pro athletes. He's been in the Division One level, multiple sports. Uh, he was working here in Tampa. He's Him and I go literally back 30 years ago on various, we met on various <laughs> internet platforms. <laughs> Uh, anonymously, and he reached out to me about a year and a half ago, I think now. God, dude, that's crazy how fast time time flies. It was when I was in Playa. Mm -hmm. It was like, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but we used to talk, blah, blah, blah. And he's been in my private membership group. And then of all places, I moved back to Tampa, Florida in the middle of the summer. And Jim spoke at my um, first ever uh, Fully Optimized Health Live in September. Actually, it was in October of last year. And now he has, him and his dog have moved to Nicaragua and he is building a gym and doing all sorts of amazing stuff live from the beaches of Nicaragua every day and it's been a while we actually attempted to do a podcast earlier last year I think it was in December and we both had internet problems so we decided to push it forward to now and here we are and we're going to talk about a lot of cool stuff but man why don't you just share a little bit about your drive uh from the states with your dog um, down to Nicaragua because obviously my wife encountered something very similar leaving uh, Playa del Carmen and going through Mexico and driving along the, the continent the continental shelf of Mexico into Texas and you did the opposite but how was that before you in in, in taking uh, that that long for circuit circuitous circuitous route to Nicaragua I'll never do it again I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> It yeah, was, remember we told you it was. Well, gonna no, be like, I knew I knew it was going to be difficult, but I didn't have any other choice. I mean, I had I, my, I had to get my dog down here somehow, and I know, and so I didn't have any other choice. But it, I mean, it was manageable. I went into it with the attitude that it was going to be difficult, and and I just laughed at everything that was challenging. Sure, it is very difficult to go south. It's it's incredibly easy to go north. Um, thousands of people marching up the streets going north. It's a full out invasion. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Camps are set up for these people. That's unreal. Uh, They're just I mean, flooding these, them these, into the States. These people, right? these people are very well funded. You know, they've got buses yeah. for them. They've got places for them to stay. They're handing out water and food for them. So, you know, we won't get into all that, but, um, y you know, things are changing too, because I used to, when I'd go to Mexico, you just drove across and nobody even checked you. Now they stop me and search my entire vehicle in Mexico took me three days to get through Mexico. Um, didn't have any major issues. There was more military presence than I've ever seen. Uh, just, you know, when you're driving through Mexico, you just have to prepare for anything. One minute you're on a really nice highway. The next minute you're on a road that that's like somewhere desolate. And there's, you know, what you could be driving down the road and, and all of a sudden there's a hundred horses on the road with a military escort or, you know, there's, who knows what's on the road, but, you know, I went through, I went down, uh, and then I cut across through, uh, Tabasco and through the mountains there and that ran into some really thick fog, but got down into Guatemala. I did Guatemala overnight. I ran into a trucker, uh, who had seen my license plate and he was a big Tampa Bay lightning fan. So we started <laughs> talking about hockey, which was really funny. And he's like, look, how long you plan on staying in Guatemala? I'm like, I don't want to be here very long. He's like, you need to do it overnight. So the guy was like, look, let me give you some advice. Follow your GPS because the roads are unmarked. There's no street lights. There's no lines on the road. He's like, the GPS is going to guide you for the road is. He's like, if anyone tries to flag you down, just run them over and keep going. And so I made it through. 
I made it through Guatemala. It took me eight and a half hours to drive through Guatemala at night. Um, it's not a very big country. Then I went into El Salvador. I had to sit at the El Salvadorian border because I was probably the first person. They said I was the first person to ever drive through Guatemala to go into the border late in the evening and then come out. At, I got there at four o'clock in the morning. They made me wait till 11 because the lady that checked me into Guatemala hadn't put me in the computer yet. So they couldn't let me into, into El Salvador. So I waited till 11 o'clock and then I stayed in El Salvador for for two days to kind of recover from driving all night and then uh, uh, did Honduras and Nicaragua on the last day. And Nicaragua is actually the most well-organized, uncorrupt, professional border that I crossed. All the rest, they're, they're trying to fleece you. And, and so I, you didn't get stopped. You didn't get stopped one time and run, and, and it, shook, shaken down. And, uh, I got stopped. I showed them my passport and I smiled and no Espanol and and they laughed. And, and you, actually, the funny thing is, is the most difficult people that I had to encounter were female. Um, this one lady in, in Honduras. She's in the the uh, very very attractive lady. She's in the the Honduran military, and she stopped me and she was giving me the riot act. I mean, she was like, you know. Speaking One, in English or Spanish? Uh, broken, broke. Uh, she was trying to speak English, but it was mostly Spanish, but I could understand a lot of what she was saying. And she was like, sure. we're going to search her vehicle, da, 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 da. And I noticed she had just gotten her nails done. And I was just like, your nails look really good. Like, I, you must have just gotten them done. And she started blushing and just kind of melted. That's awesome. And then she was like, oh, you can go now. No one's noticed my nails today That's except awesome. you. So, you know, I mean, you just, you treat people well and you're nice. And, and you know, I had a little problem with, uh, a fuel leak because the roads are so rough that it shook my fuel line loose and I pulled into this garage and I knew they were in, uh, you know, this, this garage on the side of the road in Mexico. And, and they, and I, I knew they were making fun of me the whole time. Uh, but I just smiled and laughed and, and, and they treated me fairly and they charged me like $5 to like, to fix the fuel line. So, um, you treat people well, you don't act like an asshole and, and, um, you know, if you don't act like a pompous idiot, like most Americans do when they come down here, um, most people are going to treat you very well. And um, that's a hundred percent true. I know that for a fact. I mean, especially here in Nicaragua, the people are just so cool. They, they really appreciate, you know, like I sponsored the local baseball team here. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I literally can't, the people are inviting me to their homes. Hey, let, 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 let me cook you a meal. Come, you know, come meet my family. Uh, you know, won't let me pay them anything for it, you know, because I sponsored their baseball team. It's really neat to see these people are just have so much gratitude for what they have. You know, people here aren't, they don't get caught up in material things. You know, they, they, it's just, it's just a totally different culture. It's very refreshing. That's awesome, man. Um, I'm, I mean, I mean, obviously again, it was a special interest to me. That's why I asked you to talk about it because my wife did the exact same thing. I mean, as you know, my wife hired an actual professional mule, uh, the helper, uh, cross because it is it's very dangerous I mean obviously you're a big guy and you know can take care of yourself but like it is it is weird that's awesome though that your fuel line got messed up how bad are the roads they're that bad, uh, Mexico's pretty good I there I had to go through I had to take an alternative route because there was a mudslide that blocked a road and that's what pretty much shook my Guatemala there's some potholes that would kill most cars um you just got I mean, you just got to, like, the, the difference between driving in the U.S., like, say it you drive. literally break the axle of well, that it, when you go into it. When you're in the U.S. and you're driving from, say you're driving from, like, Lexington to St. Louis, you can be asleep at the wheel. You know, you can be texting on your phone, not to say that I've ever done that, but, you know, you can be kind of like, in. you can be on a conversation. When you're driving in Central America, you have to be 100% focused. Like, here... I'm driving down the road. I could come around the corner. There might be 50 cows in the middle of the road or a goat or a pig or somebody's kid or, you know, some guy broken down on the side of the road with his motorcycle or chickens or rocks or boulders or you don't know. Like, you, you know, you see, you can't go flying down and the road all of a sudden, you know, there could be like part of the road. It's just all of a sudden just is not in a good place. So, or there could be a massive sugarcane truck that like takes up the whole road or tractors or who knows. Right, right. right. So, you know, you've got to be 100% in the moment when you're driving. Uh, and at night, especially because it is dark as F. I mean, it is. Yeah, because there's no lights. There's I no mean, street lights. all nature. Yeah, I all love, nature. I, lo I love it. Like, there's no street lights where I live. Like, when you turn the lights off in your house, it is pitch dark. And um, it's in the sky, you can see all the stars. I mean, it's just a totally different animal. So when you drive in Central America, six hour drive kicks your ass. 
All and, I can uh, only imagine. You just got to be very vigilant. You got to carry cash because um, a lot of these places will tell you you can pay with a visa, and then they get done filling up with your car, your car. They're like, no, no, I only take the pesos, you know. So, and then the the toll roads in Mexico, you've got to have pesos. They won't take dollars. Just little details like that. So if you are going to do it, make sure you're very prepared. Do your research. There's tons of videos online. Understand you're going to have to pay a little bit of money to get across the borders. Like in Honduras was the worst border I crossed. There's probably 500 people in line. I had to pay a guy a couple hundred bucks to get me to the front of the line and to get me through. And then he tried to rip me off more at, at, at the exit. But, you know, I just- How, how people, did he do that? Just so, just so we know, like, because I think people find value in this. What will what, happen is, so in Honduras was the worst. Usually, like in Guatemala, there's these thing called, they're called like handlers or they're called, you know, they'll come up, they kind of speak English and they're very helpful and they usually cost you 60 bucks or something. They'll be like, I'm a good, you know, what do you charge? I'm a good Christian man. You can trust, you can trust me. Um, and then they'll get to the end and they'll be like, amigo, I did. And they, it's right because it's so complicated. You have to go get a photocopy here. And yeah, this, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And so they, they walk you through all that. They save you a lot of time, but at the end they'll try and get you for more than they promised. Or they'll say, Hey, you know, like, uh, that, that $60 only covers the other guys that were helping me. It doesn't cover me. And That's the thing is, me and Monica when we were yeah. crossing uh, from Peru to Bolivia. Yeah, and it, they, you don't want to piss these people off because they're friends with all the cops, and like, see, so you 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 you'll, you'll say, okay, uh, here's you know they want sixty, here's forty, you know, and you, you you treat them well, you're nice, you don't lose your temper, you're patient, um, and it, there's not a problem. But like in Honduras, the government officials were working with the handler because I knew the rules and I knew what I needed, and they were trying to talk me into you know saying that I needed things that I didn't. And so I gave the guy like half of what I promised and said, Hey man, thanks. And I went on my way, but you know, it, it's going to cost you a little bit of money uh, to go through each border to make the, make the process a lot smoother. Cause I wouldn't, if I wouldn't have paid that guy, I probably would have been in line for eight or 10 hours in Honduras. It's just a, yeah, it's just a yeah. shit show. Well, when we were, when we, when we had the same thing, when we were in Bolivia, it was at least an hour and a half wait. And so, yeah, we had a guy that we were paying, mm -hmm. even who had to pay. You know, he's supposed to be the guy. I mean, our guide who got us there then transferred us to another guide in Bolivia, but they, we still had to play a game and we were at the border for three hours and we went through the same bullshit. You know, they, you know, the guy was like, Hey man, we're really sorry, but they hate Americans here. And here's the story. The CIA did this to so-and-so who's the president of Bolivia at the time. And this is back in, you know, this is back in November, uh, 2022. Well, the, the fact that Nicaraguans actually don't mind gringos just goes to show you the kind of people they are because the united states did some horrible things to this country you know oh dude it's and the sanctions that they're still putting on this country is is it's insane. not really the usa though it's the vatican yeah <laughs> I mean, we, we could get four, we, could, we could get into that but 400 years ago yeah. but yeah you're right you just have to go into it with the attitude that um you're going to be patient you're going to be nice you're not going to lose your temper you, you know like here when i go out to eat for example i know it's going to take an hour maybe an hour and a half. When I order my food, it might take 20 minutes, 30 minutes to come out. That they just that's how they operate here. It's not yeah. it you know, it's not like Domino's, it's at your door in 10 minutes or it's free, right? Which is what I love about this culture. It's it's a lot more laid back. It's it's, you know, manana, we'll get it done manana, you know. And so you just have to adjust your mindset to be like I'm going to be more laid back. I'm not going to stress out over things that really don't matter, you know. Exactly. Well, I mean, the thing is though is I mean, you could just tell in your demeanor, bro, like you're, you're exactly like I was at the same time last year. You don't have any stress. You have very low cost of living. You're not dealing with the matrix of living in the United States. You don't deal with stress anymore. You have no stress. You're so calm. You're so serene. You're living right now as, as the way a human is supposed to live. This is the only stress I have in my life right here. And that's I what can, I mean. So and I can turn living, it off. Right. Like that's a, and that's a massive stressor if you allow it to be, but the truth is, is that living in the United States, as you know, we're being bombarded from the frequency. We're being bar bombarded from the shit they spray in the skies. We're being bombarded by the shitty food. I mean, as I told you, bro, Florida is, I mean, it, we had one week last week. It was blue skies the entire week and it was unbelievable. And it's back to complete chemtrails. It is so bad. I mean, something is coming. We don't have to talk about that. We'll get into your life story here in a second. But like the reality is, is that. You're in the right place. We're all right now, the way I look at it, we're all exactly where we're supposed to be. 
And it's only our resistance to that awareness that prevents us from like living a level 10 life. Like you were saying, all we were talking off air and being in flow. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. Um, all sure. right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the health scares that you dealt with and, you know, how it really changed your perspective. And, 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 you know, I'll give your backstory. I mean, you're a strong man. You're a fucking monster. You know, you were 275. Power lifter, power lifter strength athlete, football well, player, I mean, you MMA. Were you were an elite Anunnaki Prometheus type being. I do, I do have a lot of, uh, I do have a lot of Neanderthal in my DNA. You were, you were a very large man who was very strong, very capable of prodigious feats of strength. And you had an awakening. Talk about it. Well, I mean, I used strength sports, contact sports to manage a lot of hate and anger for many, many years. And we'll get into that later, a little bit later, but, um, it was in probably 2011, 2000. 10, somewhere in there. I was a strength coach. I was working at a place called Lexington Athletic Club in, 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 in Lexington, Kentucky. I ended up leaving there and going to another gym. I was working as an independent contractor. I was working from five in the morning till eight at night. I was training like a maniac. I was on a lot of performance enhancing drugs. And I ended up getting ulcerative colitis. And um, it really, it got my attention. You know, when you're sitting on the toilet, not to be yeah. graphic, bleeding your ass out. And then they wanted to do a they wanted to give me a colostomy bag and I basically said, I'm going to figure out how to deal with this. I am not, my dad had colitis and, and, or has colitis and had a colostomy bag. And I just like, I'd rather die. That's just me. Yeah. So I walked out of the hospital and I started researching and, you know, figured out stress was a huge part of that. I ran into, you know, information from, you know, Rob Wolf at the time who I actually know from college and before he was a paleo guy and Paul Check. Paul Check started talking about in order to work out, you have to be able to work in. And, you know, I was training, but I was taking days off, but it was an eight in the morning, you know, five in the morning till eight at night day, tons of stress. I, I was always on and powerlifting is a sport where you rev yourself up. You're in this right. hyper, you know, your hyper, your nervous system's just, just rolling. Right. And so I wasn't doing anything to like relax and chill. And, and I just didn't even know what that was. And so that was a huge wake up call to me that I needed to, you know, make some major lifestyle changes. And so I started doing things like float tank and meditating and getting out in nature like I did when I was a kid. And sure. I used nicotine uh, also to help. You know, nicotine is very effective in calming colitis. And so I used that combination of dietary change, lifestyle change. And I started implementing it with my clients. I actually had a t shirt made. I was working at a local CrossFit in Lexington and and I ended, ended up getting fired from there or removed or whatever you want to call it. But, uh, they had a t-shirt that said rest later on the back. And so I had a t-shirt that said rest more on the back. That was kind of my, my little, uh, they didn't like that very much, but you know, my, my whole point is that you want to rest so you can go hard, you know? Um, and most people have got the, you know, with the modern life, you know, you're constantly under stress, you're constantly doing stuff. We don't ever take that. And I, that's one of the things I appreciate about you is you talk a lot about in the group about getting out in nature, being calm, be still and know you know, getting it connected with your higher self. That stuff's so important and it's so overlooked in our modern society because if you're constantly in an alert state uh, where you're you're constantly in this stress state, you're so easy to control and manipulate because you, you can't yeah. use reason and logic. You're just, you're in a survival mode, right? So that was the first real awakening for me and it really changed my training philosophy of, of how I approach training my my clients. And, and then it was uh, later on down the road, I'd, I'd opened my own gym and it was probably, I can't remember the exact years and dates, but, um, I, I was dating a, a young lady who was like, your feet are gross. You know, like, you know, I'm in the gym all day. I'm sweating and, you know, she's like, your feet are gross and no more, no more fun for you until you get a pedicure. So I went and got a pedicure six days later. I was in the, in the ER getting, or in the, in the hospital, getting my leg prepped to be amputated. And of course, the funny thing is, is here I am with my leg getting prepped to be amputated and they're trying to give me a flu shot. I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you're endangering everyone in here. And I'm like, they all have the flu shot, right? They're like, yeah, well, I'm then they're safe. I, I'm the only person oh, I'm endangering is myself. Right. And so finally they just, they gave up because I said, I'm not taking that thing. It doesn't work anyways. Show me the research that shows that it works. And we argued for an hour over it. I'm like, I'm about to get my leg amputated. I, d- I don't really give a shit about the flu shot. So luckily I, d- I didn't have to do that. But uh, luckily they were able to stop. It was a staph infection and luckily they were able to stop it with antibiotics. And I got this speech on the way out that I needed to be on oral antibiotic for the rest of my life. And I needed to 
wash myself down with this like toxic crap that they gave me uh, because it was going to come back. And sure enough, three or four months later, I had a reoccurring infection, but this time it's, you don't have, it's like having the flu, but you don't have rest, like you don't have respiratory symptoms or anything. And I ended up going septic. And so this was happening two or three times a year. And, um, I was running out of options. I was, I had done vicdomycin. I had done all the crazy, I even suggested blood, you know, blood transfusion at one point when I was having a really hard time because it would go from like me feeling like kind of weird to like having 105, 106 fever in like literally an hour or two. So I would run to the emergency room. They put me in an alcohol bath and they were like, well, there's, you're just going to have to deal with this for the rest of your life. And I said, this can't be, this can't be, this can't be. And I ran into a very controversial guy named Dr. Jack Cruz at a, at a paleo effects seminar. And I started talking with him and he was like, you know, the sun regulates your entire immune system, right? When's the last time you've seen a sunrise? I was like, well, I start work at five in the morning. I don't get done till late at night. He's like, you know, when's the last time you've been outside? I was like, I didn't really go outside that much. I was in the gym. He's like, man, you need to get more skin in the game. You need to get you know, your light environment. Literally right. and figuratively. Correct. And he's, you know, I wore sunglasses all the time. And I, so I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And I fired all my morning clients. Everyone hated me. I didn't start till nine o'clock. Went outside every sunrise, even in the winter. Uh, when the weather was decent, I'd take my shirt off even in the winter. And sure enough, I started getting more serious. I changed my light environment in the gym. I kept the doors open more often. I added some different lights in the gym to make it more like natural sunlight. And sure enough, I haven't had any infections since I started doing that. And so I, that was when I, that's when I was like, I really like, what am I doing? I'm like, all these people spend all day in an office and they're coming to me to get healthier. And what they really need is to go outside. So I'm like, I can't by good conscience, like have a gym that's indoors. So how am I going to start an outdoor gym? Kentucky, that's just not possible. Um, and I looked at Florida. Too, yeah. It's just not possible. The weather's just too horrible. I'd be out there by myself. Um, and, and then, so I looked at Florida too expensive and I looked at, I looked at Tulum too expensive. And then I found this place in Nicaragua and I started talking with them. They're like, Oh, great. Come on down here. We'd love to have you. So, um, that's what I'm doing here is I, I, I love training people. I just don't, I think the, the seminar we did was the longest I'd ever been inside I know, I remember uh, you telling since, me that. since I'd had my, my infection stuff. Cause I, I really, cause right now I'm in a open outdoor kitchen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I literally spend 97. The only time I'm inside is when I sleep and I, I never turn the artificial lights on. So um, that's when I, I was passionate about, hey, you know what? I'm going to encourage people to get outside more. You know, we encourage all our clients to do the stand efforting, walk outside at least three times a day. But I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I'm going to have a gym that's actually outside, you know, under a palata, yeah. obviously. But, um, you know, that's not artificially lit. That's that's, you know, you're out in the elements, you're grounded while you're training. So, um, that's, that's pretty much where I came to, but, um, yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, it's an awesome story. I mean, I mean, let's be honest, bro. My, most of the guys in your side of the world don't, don't find what you found and die. Well, and that's die true. It's very true. Way. And that's the way I am. Like I, 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 unfortunately I'm not very good at hitting the brakes and I have to hit the tree in order for me to learn. And I, I, I attract a lot of clients. So you know, I work with Dr. Leland Stillman. And a lot yep. of our clients are the same way. You know, you tell them to cut down two, you give them an ax, tell them to cut down two trees, they cut the whole forest down. So, <laughs> you know, that's just kind of how we, and you're a lot like that too, you know? So it's, uh, you learn from these things and uh, I'm very, very grateful that I'm still here, but I'm, I'm grateful that I'm able to give a different perspective to people a, a little bit about, hey, you might just need to slow your roll from time to time, especially if you want to push hard. I'm not saying you shouldn't push hard. I'm just saying you need to switch it off. You know, you got to have, you got to have the yin and the yang. You got to have the light. You got to have the dark. And uh, our modern society is this low level of chronic stress at all times. I compare it to getting in your car, sitting in your driveway, starting it up and revving the shit out of it, and never driving anywhere. That's modern life. And people wonder why they're, is, they're, why they're exhausted. And then is. they try and throw, you know, we're going to go do a hit class four times a week because I've sat on my butt in front of the computer all week. I haven't done any low level manual uh, activity or labor. And then I'm going to throw this intensity in there and it's going to fix the fact that I've been a sedentary zoo animal um, all week. I'm going to fix that with three one hour sessions and it just doesn't end well for most people. I mean, think about, I mean, yeah, dude, I mean, you're preaching to the choir, but like think of CrossFit and how they market to like basically completely unconditioned, totally unfit, middle, 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 you know, average to middle age men and women, you know, housewives, you know, uh, 
guys that you know uh, what do you call it um, or you can throw orange th- you can throw orange theory zombies. in there too in any of these high yeah, intensity orange theory or- all of it dude all of it yeah but most people don't even understand i mean you and i talk about this obviously and you know shout outs to the private membership group where we have really deep conversations about this but most people don't even understand that there's a time and a place for high intensity exercise that's correct and you can't be somebody fasting all day long and then jumping on and doing you know, high intensity uh, cardio, whatever it is, uh, who cares? Orange Theory, you know, CrossFit, you know, burpees. I mean, they're blowing their bodies apart, right? They're damaging their metabolism. They're increasing muscle loss. I mean, it's just insane. But dude, that's the world we live in today. I mean, you and I both talked about, I mean, when you came to my seminar and you lectured and taught all these people, my, myself included, my wife, you know, proper form and technique, Bro, 95% of people go to the gym their whole lives and don't even know how to lift. Here's the thing with that. What people don't understand about lifting, like say the bench press, for example. If you only bench press, if you bench press and bench press and bench press, your body is going to adapt in the shape that it creates to be really good at the bench press. Right. You're going to lose other options like shoulder mobility and things like that, right? So a lot of the activities that people are doing are driving one strategy. The key is, is to have other things that you do to shut that strategy off so that you're not constantly turning yourself, you know, because the power lifter becomes a fire hydrant, right? It's kind of like a car. If you stiffen the suspension and you make it faster in a straight line, it's not going to drive as nice and it's not going to drive as well. And that's okay if that's your total goal. But most of the stuff that people are doing in the gym are driving them into a strategy that has consequences that they really don't understand. So right. incorporating some things that take you to the opposite extreme, just like blood pressure. If I'm chasing you with a machete, high blood pressure is amazing. If you have high blood pressure, you're trying to go to sleep, not so good. So you have right. to have the ability to switch from high blood pressure to low blood pressure when needed. And that same thing goes for movement. You need to be able to do high threshold things. You need to be able to do low threshold things. You need to be able to relax and you need to be able to kick ass if you need to. And most people's pyramids are inverted. The bottom of the pyramid is the, the good food, the sleep, the getting outside, the, the getting out in nature. You know, all of that is the bottom of the pyramid. On top of that is low level manual labor. You're walking, you're mowing your grass, all that stuff. And the intensity is really the top of the pyramid. And we flipped it all right. around, right? If you right. look at high level gymnasts, they spend hours walking on their hands to prepare themselves for the tumbling that they do. And so, we, we, because everything's done for us, Uber Eats, you don't build your own house, you, you don't, everything's done for you. You don't have to do jack shit, but sit on your couch and watch Netflix and eat. You you miss out like kids don't play anymore. That's the one thing I love about down here. The kids are like the first day I was here, The there's a guy that owns a store just outside the front gate and his son was on top of the refrigerator behind the bar and was jumping from the bar to the, to the refrigerator back and forth. He's like six years old. And I was just like, this is awesome. Like this is what kids are supposed to do, right? Um, they're running around playing on skateboards. They're walking on their hands They're climbing trees and they're picking coconuts at six, you know, that prepares them for more stress later on in their life and, and manual labor and all these low level activities, what helps regulate stress. And then it prepares you for more intense activities when you have to run from the bear, when you have to do something hard. Um, people don't realize the preparation, your, your body can handle all sorts of crazy stuff if it's prepared. That's absolutely true. That's well said. I mean, I don't know. I just, I still laugh when I go to gyms, you know, when I'm traveling, especially, and it was just recently that we were traveling and I can't remember what gym I was at, but like the average person doesn't even, I mean, good on them. They're there, right? Cause that's more than sure. the average person, I guess, that sure. they actually sure. committed to be in there, but it's just, you watch them exercise. And obviously we go to EOS fitness here in Tampa now. And I just look around at people and it's just like, fuck, like they've never ever had anybody instruct them. They've never had proper coaching. Their technique is screwed up. Their form is a mess. They look like shit. You know, they're in their middle age. Clearly, they're in the middle age coming to the gym. They've been coming to the gym for a long time, right? Because most people don't just start going to the gym in their mid-50s. Right. And it's just like, I mean, again, I'm not condemning or or judging them, but it's just like, we just live in a society, dude, where people just really don't want to ask for help. So, So what did people look like in the 50s and 60s? I mean, most people were walking around not obese. Correct. And they look good on the beach. They spent a lot of time outside. How many gyms were there in the 50s? Did women even work out? Exactly. They didn't. Marilyn Monroe was one of the first women that started weight training. 
So now we've got more gyms than we've ever had, and we have more- On every corner, there's Every a gym. corner, there's a gym, and we've got more obese people than ever. So maybe it's not the, the lack of exercise. Maybe it's the environment that people are spending their time in. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I, I mean, it is. I mean, and, and you know, obviously, and this is another topic, but not for today, probably, but I mean, social media is not helping. No. 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 Because people Rather watch fit bros and hoes on Instagram or and TikTok. They try or and do what they're doing. And yeah. And, and then they're, they're doing fancy stuff they don't need to do. Bro, uh, it's mostly insanity. I, I mean, that's the thing is like, you know, I, I just, I, this is perfect for you, but like, and you talk to this, about, talk to this at, at the lecture when you lecture to everybody, but I just read this article. Where was this? Somebody sent it to me, but it was like two or three days ago. There, you, you know, the, the, the number one exercise in the gyms today for women is the hip thrust. And they, it's literally, you're laughing because it's such a farce, but they, they, they did an anatomical analysis of how much muscle is actually recruited in a hip thrust compared to a, just a normal 5,000 year old squat. Sure. And it literally, Jim, is less than 7% of gluteus minimus, maximus, hamstrings, rectus femoris compared to the squat, which is 97% activation now i go i i get it that not everybody the squats for but we we've just created this insane right. world of social media where people are doing things that don't even do shit and well here's the thing for most people it's not a hip thrust it's a low back thrust <laughs> because the way they set it up is that they're set up they're set up and their rib cage and their pelvis are like this so you'll see these girls they'll literally hump the air and they'll be like this so it's really a low back thrust now, if you really want to make the hip thrust effective, get on a hip thrust machine, put your feet together, don't even use weight, and hug one knee to your chest, and then do 10 hip thrusts with a single leg, and then tell me how you feel. Then you're actually using your glutes and your hamstring. Most people are just jamming the shit out of their low back when they do that exercise. Bro, it's just insane, dude. I mean, but it, 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 just... it looks it looks cool, and it, it, makes, it makes women feel powerful, so, you know at least they're getting in the gym, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's, I, I mean, the whole system is set up for us to be on virtual reality goggles, essentially. You know, that's, that's basically where we're going, unfortunately. At my last podcast, the, the, the words that she used were Trina Felder from uh, Primal Life Organics, amazing, super switched on. She said, um, there, the entire third density is set up to profit off of us, make us sick, inflame us, uh, shorten our lifespan and so it's our job to awaken to the idea that we don't have to do any of those things that we can choose to live outside of that. complacent compliant consumer Com complacent compliant yeah three c's yeah that's really good too um all right so one of the points you have up in here which i said is like a whole podcast because i talk about this all the time um is that you say forgiveness is critical to your long-term success i mean bro it's psych scientifically proven. I mean, again, a lot of people don't want to hear this because they think we're woo-woo when we say this, but literally lack of forgiveness is what causes cancer. I mean, I talk to people about this all the time. Like, let's look at this. We're energy beings. That's People on this podcast know that. We're waveform energy beings in physical bodies. So like, how does an energy being get cancer? Well, a waveform energy being gets cancer because his physical body is in resistance to something, right? It's usually spiritual trauma, spiritual amputation, a lack of forgiveness. And then eventually over time, it leads to cellular degradation, cellular inflammation, and those things become diseases of aging, right? But the truth is, is that every person I've ever met in my life that I knew, and, and there's been many, sadly, who had a, a very you know a, a, a insidious form of cancer, a metastatic tumor, lacked forgiveness, or had someone in their life that they did not forgive for whatever it is, right? We all have shit that we can choose to forgive and let go and accept and allow, or we cannot. And most people, they hold on to the pain, dude. And they yep. just literally hold on to the pain until the pain literally becomes this ease. Well, it's it's right out of Star Wars. I mean, it's like the dark side of the force. It's very powerful, but it has consequences, right? And a lot of your combat athletes, I fell into that category. I won't get into details, but I had uh, not the most easy childhood. It certainly wasn't the worst, but you know, I had some serious resentment that I needed to deal with. The resentment, the thing about resentment is that it only hurts you, right? It's like this burning yeah. coal that just burns you and it empowers the people that you hate. And so I had That's this right. hatred and this That's anger. Right. 
And it was, you know, really sad because I was acting out in school and instead of the, you know, the pastor of my church and the, the teachers basically saying, why is this kid acting out and being this way? Instead of investigating, they basically said, well, he's aggressive and he's got all these, these, these issues with focus and attention. Let's just put him in boxing. Let's put him in football. Let's put him in wrestling. And of course I just wrecked everybody. And everybody was like, that's great. Good job. You just hurt three people. Awesome. You know? And of course that just fueled that. And when football ended, then I switched to powerlifting and then eventually I got colitis and I couldn't do that anymore. And I had to learn how to make some changes. And, and forgiveness was a huge point. I was like, why am I driving myself? Why do I have this desire to like squat a thousand pounds or, and then there's nothing wrong with that, but why am I working myself to yeah, death? Like, it'll fuck up your spine. Well, it's true. But I mean, I, you know, but what, what, where's this, this desire for me to just keep going and never be, never be content. Right. And I mean, of course, there's a lot of athletes that have used rage to drive themselves. Um, but there comes a cost with that. Right. And so I, I finally looked at myself and, and I was like, where is this coming from? And, and what it was is there was all this garbage in my closet that I just kept shoving in the closet because I didn't want to actually deal with it. That's one of the reasons why people can't sit quietly because all this stuff comes bubbling up for you to deal with. And you just like, shit, I'm just going to push it in the closet until that closet. Well, that's undone. why people vape. That's why people vape. They have so much anxiety. They vape. Right. Right. This is a distraction. So I had to get on the phone with some people and, you know, the one person in particular that I needed to forgive, I was like, Hey, look, you failed me as a, per as this and that, um, I forgive you. And they were like, how's the weather today? You know, they just couldn't even, but I just understand like they were doing the best they could. And, you know, it was, uh, it was very free. It was like, someone took like 7,000 pounds of chain off me. And here was the weird part is I had to like learn how to love training because it was good for me. And it's because I, what I wanted to do, I didn't know how to compete or do athletic activities without that anger and that rage. So it took me a while to kind of learn how to train because I actually loved it and not because I had something to prove or I had to prove to other people that I was worthy. Um, so that was, a you know, one thing I really appreciate about the group is you always talk about how much work you really need to do on yourself. You know, all the peptides in the world, HRT, everything else is not going to do anything if you have a really bad relationship with yourself. Exactly. If you don't love and trust yourself, I literally just did this podcast last night, or not last night, yesterday with this woman in Phoenix. Her name is her name is Satine Phoenix. She's actually in Scottsdale. Really interesting lady. I read her the section, which you already know because I read it at the seminar, but I read her the section from the book and she was crying. She was literally crying. You know, she's a 43-year-old woman and she has a ton of women that follow her. And she was like, this is everything. This is it. You, it doesn't matter what you tell them, how much knowledge you have, how much you teach them about fat loss, strength training, peptides, hormones. It doesn't matter if they do not truly love and trust themselves and find themselves worthy of changing the way they look and feel. It's never going to happen. They may, you know, as you know, jump into some bullshit 40 day program and lose whatever, but they'll gain it back and more because they ultimately, at the end of the day, don't feel valuable enough that they can actually maintain it. Right. They'll replace one vice with another. And like I did, you know, I, I used I use sports to manage my hatred and my anger. Um, and, and we deal with that a lot. And, and w the big thing is getting people to look within themselves as opposed to looking for some external solution, whether it's a supplement or a peptide or this or that. Those things are all great. They have great tools, but they can't be the foundation of your house. You know, And most people are, are building the foundation of their house on tools, not on solid ground. That's exactly right, dude. That's exactly right, man. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, I mean, you guys, I hope you are listening to this because if you have cancer or you know a loved one that has cancer, I literally, I wager my life, I, 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 everything I know and represent as a human, if you, to help them, go to them and say, who is it in your life that you have not forgiven? Because that is the fastest way to cure. I mean, the, the human body, as you know better than anyone, is completely capable of healing itself. It doesn't need anything. I mean, obviously we talk about things that we love and use ourselves, right? To help. Right. But at the end of the day, your mindset creates your reality. And if you want to truly heal, you have to feel worthy of healing. And it's so, so easy for you and I to talk about it right now. But I was, obviously until you get to that level of awareness, so hard for people to actually forgive. Because bro, people literally attach everything to why they're angry over so-and-so doing so-and-so to them. Well, and a lot of people get addicted to that, whether it's bad relationships or their, totally or, their or their sickness, 
they can't function without it. Like they have to be, they have to have drama in their lives. Their diagnosis is their their issue. They got Lyme disease or that, that, you know, it becomes who they are and they can't detach from that. They focus so much on the disease instead of what they need to do to be healthy. We deal with a lot of that in a, with when I work with Dr. Stillman, we do a lot of what we call mind body medicine, so to speak. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. A couple last points and then I'll let you go. Get back out to the beach. The difference between hormones for bros and longevity. I love this point. You know, I had this conversation with Ben Pakulski and of course also Stan Everding, who have obviously both come to the table also themselves, like similar to you and that, you know, they can't be doing bro dosages forever without long-term ramifications and circumstances. And let's, let's be honest. I mean, I'm actually speaking at the, nobody knows this except you now and people in the inside, but I'm speaking at the Olympia this year. It's the 60th anniversary of the Olympia. They've changed their marketing. They changed everything about what they do because they're going for longevity. They cannot keep marketing to gear headed monkeys, you know, who weigh 350 pounds, who have a, a, a systolic and a diastolic. We, we need to go back to Frank Zane physique kind of deal, right? I mean, it's not just. A hundred percent, but it's it's more of the lines of like they see where anti aging and longevity is going, right? And they realize that the money in that place is for people living longer and stronger, and so they're, you know, part of why they want me there and and, and to speak is, is is to talk about this, you know, as a representation. But I mean, I think it's important to talk about this right now as a guy who also was there mm-hmm. and now has changed and sure. and, and why, right? Well. <clears throat> You know, there, there's the whole top fuel dragster analogy, right? Top fuel dragsters have to have their engine rebuilt after every race. There's consequences. There's trade-offs for everything, right? And if you want to be, you know, a Dorian Yates or a lot of these people, you're flirting with 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 disaster. Disaster. I mean, I mean it's just you're you're on the edge. You're on the very edge. And the problem with with the performance enhancing drug kind of deal, not in all sports, but in some sports, I would say it's perspective, like the Tour de France. If you did the Tour de France drug free, you're an idiot. But like bodybuilding, you're taking large boluses. You know, you would take, I'd take two and three cc's, of, three cc's of testosterone at once, and you'd have these big swings. You know, when you're doing it for for longevity, you're taking small dosages either every day or every other day. Um, you you know, in, in bodybuilding, they'll block hormones. We don't want to do that in longevity. We want to balance. You know. Um, so it's a totally different mindset. And a lot of the things like the, the anti-estrogens, the, uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the protocols when TRT first came out were based on bodybuilding protocols and it really messed a lot of people up and it really honestly hurt the longevity, uh, because, you know, they, they, they said, well, you get all these side effects. Well, if you're taking, you know, one CC or three, two CCs every three weeks, uh, yeah, you're going to have a lot of side effects because you have this huge, massive, you know, spike and then you drop, you know, so you want to have nice, you know, nice level levels. Um, and it, it's just a totally different animal. What did you feel like? Because I mean, I, you know, I've been very open. I mean, I, my audience knows I've been on therapeutic testosterone for 24 years, but I've never gone up, dude. I mean, I've, I've probably used, as you know, like, you know, do a cycle with an anabolic and I get up to like 350 total Mm -hmm. milligrams of whatever it is I'm using a week, but I've always stayed within the realms of therapeutic, maybe a little bit over, but what is it like? I mean, I know, but I'd like for you to talk about it. Like when, when you take that much testosterone, how do you feel? Oh, you feel like you're on stop. I mean, you feel like a superhero and that, that's the problem with, you know, people say it's not addictive, but when you feel like you can destroy anything, that's why people get hooked on trend. Right. Uh, because it just makes you feel just so like aggressive. And when you're an athlete or you're a, a power athlete, that power, that, that feeling of power is very addictive. So, right. there's, you know, I, I, I took, I didn't take uh, the amounts of some people, but I would, I would go up to a thousand milligrams a week. I'd do things like echo poison, a little bit of DECA and D ball. I kept it pretty simple. I didn't never, I did trend once and, um, I felt like I wanted to kill everyone and I was like, this is not a good thing for me to be on. So I stopped. I did one injection, but I know guys that take a thousand milligrams of trend a week. I don't know how the hell they do it. The one guy I know for sure smokes a lot of weed. I think that keeps him from killing people, but it feels amazing. And it, and, and that's the thing. Do you want to go from being, when you're on it, do you want to go from being Captain America back to the little geeky dude? And it's not like I was ever the little geeky dude, but you know, when you've been a superhero, it's kind of hard to go back yeah. to being a mere mortal after you're done. 
Yeah. If you combine stimulants like Agent Orange, you combine caffeine, ephedra, aspirin. But the problem is, is these things quit working after hot a while. Stuff. You know, hot stuff, all that stuff. These things quit working after a while when you take more and more and more of it. And that's where you start getting into trouble. Now, if you have the discipline like the Russians did, where they would go on cycle and then they'd come off completely for several months, let their body normalize, right. then they'd do it again. If you look at they were lot, actually doing Dante Trudell's blast and cruise. Yeah, they were professional. They were they were way ahead of the game, and they way had, ahead. still are. Yeah, they way they had tons of patience, and they they you know you see pictures of these Russian lifters on the off season, they look like normal people, and then you see them when they're getting ready for a competition. It's two totally different people. I had this conversation with Dr. Mike Israel, who's a professional bodybuilder, and I know Mike, and he you know we were talking about this, and he's like, people just don't want to come off and let their body normalize; they just want to keep going and keep going. And I think social media plays a role in that because they always have to look jacked, they always have to be big right. and lean. Right? They can never take it like bodybuilders today; they never take an off season and never let their body normalize. And so, you know, that's part of the that's part of the problem. But that's why I have been so outspoken for so long. And that's probably why I built my reputation because I literally taught people that you could literally compete, not for Mr. Olympia, but right. you could you you could live relatively lean and muscular and maintain your health, positive correlated biomarkers, and only be on a therapeutic dose. Oh, for you sure. Know, these guys, these guys have been like I mean, guys like Frank Zane, guys like Frank Zane never yeah. did massive, massive amounts of drugs. And there were tons of other bodybuilders back then. That, you know, the golden age of bodybuilding, all those guys were using very low doses of just stuff. They weren't taking insulin. They weren't using gross I mean, look hormone. at Ronnie Coleman. I mean, he destroyed himself, but he didn't start taking steroids until after he won his first show. That's, that, that's <laughs> and, a fact. And, so, and so our, our mutual friend, Jim Brown, competed against him when he was a natural. And mm -hmm. they, they all said that he showed up at the show and he was wearing a mock, you mm -hmm. know, like a, yeah. a, a haircut mock. And nobody knew what he looked like. And he was just skinny guy, you know, small, little skinny neck. And they said when he took off his mock, everybody was like, yeah, shows over. Well, and genetics, and those genetics kind of play a huge off. role in this stuff. There's, there's, there's certain, there's certain people that no matter how many drugs they take, you know, they're, they're just never going to look a certain way. Right. And people. No, that, and Dan, people, Dan Duchesne used to talk about that. Yeah. Dan Duchesne used to talk about that. He was like, look, man, I have horrible genetics. I will never, ever take massive amounts of drugs, even though I know more about these than anybody else. Cause I would look like shit. I have small attachments, small muscle fibers, right. You know, very long levers. I mean, I met Dan, you know that I, yeah. I, I met Dan in Mexico three or four times. He mentored me. He taught me so much about, you know, may he rest in peace too. But like, that's the problem is it, it is genetics. Other great people that trained me and taught me how to lift and stuff in my days, you know, would laugh because they would say like the average pro bodybuilder doesn't know how to train. They just have amazing most genetics and show up. Just don't want to come to the fact that most professional athletes are made in the bedroom. You know, that's right. I mean, you've got to right. pick the right parents. It's hundred percent. There's a few exceptions to that, but very rarely, most of the athletes look exactly the same. Like if you look at all the Olympic swimmers up there, they're all going to look the same. And what happens in today's world, you have someone who's made like a, a Toyota 4Runner who looks at the McLaren and says, I want to be a McLaren. Well, you can right. do things to make the Toyota 4Runner, you know, faster and better, but it's never going to be a McLaren, right? And the McLaren's yeah. never going to be a 4Runner. So the idea is to become the best version of you. Like, I'm never going to look like Jay Campbell. You could stretch me out. And I'm never going to look like you, bro. Right. And, and I've had people <laughs> actually come up to me and go, I want to look like you. And I'm just like, you can't. You're you're right. too long. You're too. You know. You just. You could do all the lifting. It's like the guy that I read you the email before we got on the show. Right. Hey, right. You know, I want to look like you. And my calcium artery score is three hundred ninety nine. You know, can how can you help me? But yeah, dude, it's exactly right. I mean, if people understood that we were all biochemically unique, everyone was different. Everyone was a different end of one. What might what works for you is not going to work for me, and vice versa. But I mean, again, dude, social media, people see images and impressions on social media and then get in their mind that that's what they want to be or that's how they want to look. Most of and, those people on social media are cropping their pictures and sucking their guts that's in. Exactly. And, it's edited. There's a one guy on Instagram who goes through and, and all these people that are selling programs and courses and he goes through and shows how like, oh, your butt is like pulled out and the, the door frame is bent. I think it's goob or something like that. He's yeah, like, goobs, I watch yeah. those. It's hilarious. I just love watching those things. It's so funny. Well, I mean, for me, because Monica and I always joke about it, because obviously Monica celebrates getting older, you know, in her face, not being the way it used to be and stuff like that. But we always look at women that alter their face. Yeah. The duck lips. Yeah. Most dudes don't really like that. 
Not even that. I mean, just what they do with the filters and yeah. it's just oh, yeah, nuts. Yeah. You know, you, you see some of these people in public and then you see them on Instagram or whatever and you're like, that's not even the same fucking person. I know. I know. I know. It's insane, dude. All right. The last last point I'll let you go is um because we were joking about this off air is the whole two every you gotta eat. <laughs> you gotta eat every two to three hours, bro. You're gonna lose your gains. Well you're gonna lose your gains. I want you as a strong man. To tell people how full of shit they are, especially bros and bodybuilders, about losing muscle right. without eating for 24 to 36 to 48 hours. I mean, you know the data. I mean, it's a sham. People are so right. brainwashed that they're going to lose their muscle if they don't eat every three hours. Well, I mean, if you're trying to be Dorian Yates, then yeah, you're going to be shoveling food in your face like every hour, right? You're going to eat food on an IV. Was it Greg Kovacs that died because he-, he, he Greg Kovacs. He, Greg Kovacs. He was 396 pounds in room. I watched him. He actually trained at the gym I, I was at in, in Edmonton once. And I watched him inject a 10cc syringe uh, into himself. But he ended up having an insulin pump. But he was 400 and something pounds. Uh, it, well, like, dude, when I, when I'm, I swear to God, I met him at the Olympia in Long Beach in the mid nineties when I was, was living in Southern California and was just getting into bodybuilding or, or looking into it. And he was 396 pounds shredded. Yeah. He was a giant, by the way. He was legitimately six foot five. Yeah. He was six, four, six, five. He was, I mean, I, I watched yeah. him flip a leg press over cause he had so many plates on there and he had yeah, people on there and it catapulted yeah. in like across the gym. Just insane. But, you know, I think it was, uh, what's the God metrics guy and Bill Phillips were the ones that you got to be eating yeah, like six Scott meals Conley a day. And Bill Phillips. I mean, we're, yeah. we're designed to be able to go times without eating. Um, you know, if, if we lost muscle that easy by skipping a meal, no one would have any muscle at all. If you look at these hunter gatherer tribes in Africa and stuff, they're, they're lean and they're muscular. Uh, they go, they can go days without eating. Sometimes they, they don't have a seven 11 where they can go snack on stuff all the time. So a lot of it is marketing. You know, you got to have that post-workout shake within 15 minutes or you're going to go catabolic and you're going to lose all your muscle mass. It's it's not how it works, you know? So, but we- so many kids still believe this shit, bro. And yeah, I've had sure. so many bodybuilders come up at me and be like, bro, it's not but, true. But at least with, at least with kids, if they eat a lot and often, they actually eat enough. Most of the kids that that, that I work with, they're like, man, I want to get on, I want to get on creatine. I want to get on, I want to get on, uh, what what SARM can I take? And I'm like, did you eat breakfast today? No, I usually eat like once a day, and it's like, it's like, uh, it's like I uh, get on SARM uh, today once a day. And it's like, dude, like you're you're the most anabolic you've ever been in your life. Here's a really funny story. This when I was uh, when I was training at Westside Bar, but this is how I, I trained at Westside a few times. But I was in Lexington, and this kid who was like 17 or 18 started training with us. And he was trying, he would, he came up to me, he wanted me to get him some steroids. And I was like, dude, you don't do that now. Like, wait, like, wait till you really need it when you're in your twenties. Like, don't do it now. He's right. like, dude. I, and so he started talking to some other people. I got word that he was going to buy from somebody, on, you know, somebody else. And I was just like, okay. I, so I went to him and said, Hey dude, I'll give you, I'll give you some steroids. I've got the most powerful. I went to Kroger and got some sugar pills and I said, dude, this is the most powerful anabolic there is. It's going to turn you into an absolute monster. But here's the thing you have to do. You got to lift heavy weights with us three to four times a week. And then you got to sleep and you got to eat at every meal. You got to eat four or five times, every like four meal. times, three yeah, times a day. Times Steak, a day. rice, chicken. Three meals, three protein Yeah, chicks. and you got to drink milk and you got to, you know, drink chocolate milk after you train, all these things. I said, you got to do it religiously or else it's not going to work. So I give him these sugar pills. I can't remember how. I think I gave him three months worth. And he, he he just, I mean, he blew up like a tick. I mean, he started, yeah. he, he gained probably 15 or 20 pounds. All his lifts went up massively. He's like, man, this stuff's amazing. He comes to how me and he's more? like, man, I'm about to run out of, of this stuff. And I was like, where can I get more? I said, go to Kroger. I'll eat about halfway down. In the in the baking section, there's these you know these little capsules you can buy, and you just you put you take sugar and you put them in there. He's like, what do you mean, man? I've been taking sugar pills the whole time. I was like, yeah, dude, because all you needed to do was eat and sleep and train. What the fuck? You didn't up. need anything. So this dude, eat, it, sleep, it kind train, of taught him repeat. a lesson: eat, sleep, train, repeat. Eat, sleep, 
train. You know, I, I felt bad lying to the kid, but I, I would hate for him to go and, you know, great lesson. get stuck on that anabolic monster roller coaster. And who knows, you know, who the hell he's buying from and what it is. And, you know, before we go, let, let's talk about the biggest lie there is in the, the performance enhancing drug world. Um, if you want to tell me that you're banning it because the only argument people can give me for why it's banned is it's bad for your health, right? Which is a, which is a bogus argument. So you're Lies. telling me running into another man that's 250 pounds head at first is good for your health. You're telling exactly. me that the tour to France is good for your health. So if you're banning performance enhancing drugs because it's bad for your health, then ban the sport. Yeah, exactly. Just be like don't, don't have these competitions because- you know, you're, you're, you're doing the tour de France, you're taking years off your life. You're ramming your head into people. A lot of these, if these drugs were done therapeutically with actually, you know, think about all the suicides that would be prevented like Junior Seau and these, these, these fighters that can't produce their own hormones because they've been hit in the head. You know, um, it's a really, it's a really weird I effed up argument that, uh, we're not going to allow. But it's not. I mean, at the end of the day, bro, the dark side does not want Males and females optimized. I mean, again, we just talked about this this morning with other than the for from, entertainment. Um, well, 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 I was going to get to that. So, I mean, like, let's just be honest, right? Like, the NFL and NBA has a salary cap. It's a modern day plantation. The people that come on, you know, people get mad when I say that because they're like, Jay, they're not paid as slaves. They get paid millions of dollars. Yeah, but look at how the salary cap works. Right. An NFL player can't make any money. I mean, realistically. Until they're like fourth or fifth year, if they, you know, then they can get franchised or whatever they go on. But I mean, as you know, dude, that salary cap is designed to not pay well because the average life expectancy of an NFL player is one year. One year is the average life expectancy of an NFL player. Nobody understands this. Right. But of all the guys that come out of college, Division One, and get drafted and recruited and, and sign as free agents, you still have a life expectancy of one year. So all those things were set up. NBA is the same. Well, NBA is a and a lot longer. of that is because of the salary cap. I had plenty of friends of mine that I played football with that were not very good that ended up in the NFL because they could run down on kickoff for the minimum, right? So you get a guy that's been there for two or three years, but he's not good enough to be a starter, and all he can play is special teams. Well, you just replace him with another guy coming out that pay him hundred. You know, you don't have to pay him the million dollars a year. You can pay him two fifty. So a lot of those guys just get used and and chucked out, right? Yeah, dude, that's literally 100%. All right, well, let me share your stuff here. So on IG, follow this man. He's got some amazing shit. Happens every single day. He does lives from the beach in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. And he also is at stillmanwellness.com, which is where he coaches and works with Dr. Um, Stillman, who's a really cool dude. Jim, I love you, man. I appreciate you coming on. He will be at the seminar uh, later this year, the Jay Campbell, which has not been announced. Um, yeah. Fully optimized health live, which will be number two, but we haven't actually announced the date, but it will be great later in September. If the this wheels year, are so still more, on the school bus, I'll be there. More on that coming if his wheels are still on the bus and the United States still exists. So, man, ladies and gentlemen, and all the amazing folks, including reptilians who watch the Jay Campbell podcast, please support the amazing people that come on Jay Campbell podcast. Tell them about my Halloween costume. <laughs> He, he wore a reptilian mask and he came in the house at a party and screamed, divorce Jay Campbell. I work for the DEA. We're taking him in. Like my whole house freaked out. And of out. course my you dog. were in the back somewhere. Who knows what the hell yeah, you were doing? Yeah, I was actually back here working. I, I can't remember what I was doing, but I, I heard you yell. I just didn't know it was you. There was a bunch of people over here, but, uh, but follow him at Jim Laird on Instagram. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see all of you guys really soon.